Hello, my name is Dr. Toby Channing, and welcome to this Introduction to Intensive Care Medicine web series. This series is designed as an Introduction to Intensive Care Medicine, also called Critical Care Medicine, and is aimed at healthcare professionals who have never worked in intensive care before. I hope to give them some idea of the basics and hopefully give them a head start before they begin work on the unit. Each of these webcasts will be around five minutes in length, and we'll aim to cover one of the major topics in intensive care medicine. I hope they'll be easy to digest, and act as a starter for the topic, although further reading may well be required. This first one will cover why intensive care medicine is its own speciality, and we'll also cover some of the basics of the intensive care unit and how it works. So what is intensive care medicine? Well, it's the area of medicine that deals with at least one, if not multiple organ failures. It's a relatively young speciality, only achieving faculty status within the last 10 years. And the speciality has mostly come about by the advent of new technologies. And as those new technologies have arisen and have given us the ability to support more organ systems, a knowledge base has grown around it. And as a knowledge base grows, it becomes harder and harder for non-specialists to keep up and then to deliver the same level of care as a specialist could. Another reason it deserves to be a speciality in its own right is some of the specialist skills that come with it. So an intensive care doctor needs to be able to put in central lines, arterial lines, and also most usually be able to perform advanced airway management. These procedures are high risk and come with complications and it requires specialist knowledge to be able to prevent those complications, but also to deal with those complications if they arise. Another important thing to bear in mind is that specialist skill and knowledge isn't just about the medics, it's also about the rest of the MDT. So you need specialist nurses, physios and pharmacists, all with knowledge about the complications intensive care patients get, the medicines that they offer and are on, and the interactions, and also the equipment that needs handling. So what makes an intensive care unit different from a normal ward? Well, it's a combination between the staff, which we've touched upon, the equipment and the physical space. In terms of the physical space, intensive care unit rooms need to be larger than standard ward rooms. And this is because of the amount of equipment that needs fitting into one space. So for each patient, they may have a ventilator, a hemofiltration machine, as well as other equipment, all that needs to be near the bedside. These machines are large and cumbersome. Another consideration is how you power all these machines. So if you can see in the picture, there's two pendants hanging from the ceiling. Each of these will have banks of plug sockets. If you look closely, you can also see they have piped oxygen, piped air and piped suction. It is important to have multiple sources of oxygen in case one fails. Now that we have covered the physical aspects of the intensive care unit, we'll move on to the organ support that we can provide. As you can see from the diagram, these are the primary organs that we can provide support for. Neurologically, we can provide sedation and ventilation, both of which can help control intracranial pressure. We can also monitor this pressure using specialist bolts. This is usually done on a specialist neurointensive care. From a respiratory point of view, we can again provide intubation and ventilation, and this is the bulk of the work of intensive care, and we will cover ventilation in another episode of this web series. We can also provide cardiovascular support, so that includes something as simple as fluids. These can be provided on the wards, but we can also provide vasopressors, so drugs to bring up your blood pressure, inotropes, drugs that will increase the contractility of your heart, but we can also use specialist cardiac output monitoring to monitor the effect of these, something not able to be done on the wards. Also, many consultative intensivists are able to do what's called FICE echoes. These are echoes done at the bedside to specifically assess cardiac output. Finally, we can provide renal replacement therapy. So this is hemofiltration or hemodialysis, depending on the mode that that intensive care does. So these generally encompass the indications for an admission to intensive care. So either one of these organs is failing and they need to be supported, or there is a significant risk that they will fail 
and therefore need close monitoring and to be within reach of an intensive care doctor to be able to perform these interventions. So we have spoken about the organ support machines that we can provide and the physical space of the intensive care. Another very important aspect is monitoring. Pictured here is an example of an intensive care chart, obviously not filled out. You can see how complicated it is, but the idea behind this is that you can put all the monitoring and numbers in one single place. This monitor includes the basic observations that would occur on the ward, but also things like urine output, the levels of all the drugs that people are on, size of pupils, the ventilation pressures, but also ABGs. These things are monitored on a continuous basis, although they're usually documented hourly. The picture on the right is an example of a monitor that you might see above a patient's bed on the intensive care unit. These are not dissimilar to the ones found in resus and the ones sometimes found on acute medical care wards in their monitoring bays. It is useful to know how to set these up, to set alarm limits, and most importantly, how to silence them. We will try and cover this in another episode of this web series. The final piece of the intensive care puzzle, and probably one of the most important pieces, is the intensive care nurse. It is this higher level of nursing that makes intensive care unique among the wards. The two levels of intensive care are usually referred to as high dependency or HDU and then intensive care as ICU. They're also called level two and three. HDU is level two, ICU is level three. A single ITU nurse is able to look after two high dependency patients, but would only be able to look after one intensive care patient. The high dependency patients are usually not intubated and will likely have a single organ failure. Whereas the level three patients will have multiple organ failure and beyond things that require a high nursing input, such as renal replacement or a ventilator. Other important aspects of the ICU nurses are their experience levels. They are generally qualified for more than a few years before they become critical care nurses. They have several weeks of training on top of their existing training and the higher banded nurses will also usually have done a diploma in critical care meaning they have specialist critical care knowledge and skills it would be very difficult to look after a critical care patient without an intensive care nurse so that brings us to the end of the first part in this series thank you for listening and i look forward to seeing you in the next one